Uh, we are approaching the finale uh, of the course here. We ended last time by talking about, the very, uh, talking about the very first attempt to broaden our evolutionary algorithm to evolve both bodies uh, and brains. And we started in on lecture 25, looking at evolving a, a new class, a relatively new class of robotics, uh, soft robots. We looked at one example why you might want to uh, you might want to evolve soft robots. One of the nice things about soft robots and soft animals is they're able to deform their bodies and enter and work in environments that may be difficult or impossible for rigid robots to enter uh, and work in. So what we're going to look at in this lecture is again continuing on now with evolutionary algorithms that are going to modify the bodies of soft robots. Uh, bodies and brains of soft robots simultaneously. Before we get into that, any questions about final projects? Clarifications regarding A-B testing? We're all good? Okay. All right. So inspired uh, by our friend uh, the octopus, some of you may know Professor uh, Cini, uh, who teaches here in the CS department. Uh, back when he was a PhD student, he was working with uh, myself and Hod Lipson at Cornell University uh, at the time. And around uh, the mid 2010s, two, two a brand new kind of physics engine was emerging, which is a physics engine that allows to simulate deformable bodies. And we'll talk about that simulator uh, in a moment. But it's sort of, again, like Sims did back in the early 90s, showing what the potentials for physics engines could be, even though he wrote the physics engine himself. No other physics engines existed at that time. Uh, Nick uh, evolved this soft robot that was able to deform and find its way out of various apertures uh, in its cave as sort of a demonstration or proof of principle what these brand new soft body simulators could do. Yeah. Uh, I've asked Nick for a video of this and I know he has one. I haven't been able to get a hold of one yet. Uh, if I do before the end of the semester, I'll play it for you. Okay, so what is this soft-bodied uh, simulator? It was actually reported in the literature in 2014. Um, it's made up of two parts, one called voxelize, and the other part of the simulator called voxcad. And like PyBullet that you're working with, voxelize, which we're going to talk about now, does all the heavy lifting, does all the actual physics and then VoxCAD draws a version of the underlying physics. Yeah? PyBullet comes with uh, a standard uh, graphics package, which is what you've been using throughout this course, but there's no reason why you can't write out all of the physics being generated by PyBullet and read it into some other graphics library, uh, some other graphics program, and draw it there. Right? In most physics engines, the physics and visualization are separated for various reasons. One of them that's useful for us, of course, is you can turn off the graphics and run the physics much faster. Yeah. Okay, so as the name uh, of this uh, physics engine implies, it's based on voxels or 3D pixels. We're gonna talk about simulation in a moment. Towards the end of this morning, we'll get to sim to real. Can you actually take a robot made of voxels and turn it into reality? We're working on it. So I'll pass this around when we get to the sim to real part this morning. Okay, for now, as usual, we're restricting ourselves to virtual environments. Uh, as you can see uh, here, we're going to try and construct our robot bodies as collections of 3D pixels or voxels. And each voxel in voxelize can be assigned a different material property. Yeah. You'll notice the two different material properties shown here, red and blue, and then this rainbow visualization after. Anybody have any idea what exactly these colors are representing here just by looking at this GIF? What do the red and blue represent here? Uh, not quite, so it's a good guess. This is a passive material at the moment, so we're actually not even at robots yet. This is just simulating a piece of passive material. Remember the first few weeks of the assignments, you were building up your robot, and you did, before you had any motors, there was no, your material wasn't active, right? It was just a passive 
collection of rigid components. That's what you're looking at here. What do you think the red and the blue represents? The red is a material with lower stiffness and the blue is higher stiffness? Absolutely, right? So if you look very carefully, you'll notice that the middle part of this flexible beam is not deforming very much, but the, uh, the base and the tip are. What about the rainbow colors? I promised you at the beginning of the course this was going to be a very broad course. We we're going to touch on lots of different subjects. We're now moving into mechanical engineering and on into material science. Any ideas? Why would the base of this passive flexible beam be red in the rainbow plot and blue out towards the tip? You can see, obviously, there's a gradation of color, so it's probably some continuous property. Is it like shear force or something? Shear force, right? So if you, you grab an object and you pull up on one side and pull down on the other, the, the particular kinds of forces that are felt inside that material known as shear forces. Yeah, We've talked about linear force pushing something. We've talked about rotational force causing something to rotate. What you're looking at here is shear forces. So the voxels that are up near the base, they're being pulled or sheared much more strongly than the ones out towards the tip. Yeah. So this GIF is just for us a reminder that we're building up a, a structure that has arbitrary three-dimensional geometry, but each individual element in that geometry can have different material properties. This is a very common way to simulate uh, basically everything in engineering from bridges to cars to robots to soft materials, which is to use a particular approach to simulation called a finite element a finite element method. Yeah, there's also finite element analysis. Finite element methods, where we have some complicated structure, like the chair that you're sitting in right now. It's got some rigid components. It's got some deformable components. You can simulate it with enough finite elements, enough small things. And by assigning different material properties to those things, you can approximate that physical structure to some arbitrary precision. Yeah, makes sense? Okay, obviously lots of differences between uh, the Vox simulator that you're seeing here and the simulator you've been working with. What are some other differences? Again, we haven't got to robotics yet. We're, even, we're just looking at passive materials. Obviously, generally speaking, the difference is Pie Bullet simulates rigid materials. Vox simulates soft materials. Can we be a little bit more specific? How, do those, how are those differences embodied in this simulator? I think a big difference, how I expect this to work, is that in our simulation, if things are like pressing against each other, not really much happens. Okay. But in this, if they're like pressing against each other, that'll like add to the force, I think. Uh, absolutely. So these voxels that are pushing and pulling on one another, that collision detection and resolution, how that's handled is very, very different uh, in the Vox simulator here than how it is in, in Pi Bullet. Absolutely. One of the ways it's different, which I think you were getting at, is forces inside, uh, inside these soft bodies tend to propagate quite a bit, right? If you were to push against the tip of this uh, soft beam, that force, that linear force, if you're pushing against it, those forces would start to propagate through the body. Not so much in a rigid material, right? It'll usually rotate the joints, and that's, that's kind of it. Other differences? Uh, the one that strikes me is how it's like clearly gravity is in play, but the beam is just kind of like fixed in midair. Okay. Whereas in ours, the, whatever you put in, it just drops. Just drops. That is true. There are ways in Pi Bullet to weld something to the to the world so that it doesn't fall. But you're right. That is a difference we haven't actually looked at in Pi Bullet. What changes about links in Pi Bullet? The physical objects that are simulated during a Pi Bullet simulation. What changes and what doesn't change? In the Vox simulator, what changes and what doesn't change about a voxel? 
that you can see from this GIF. Let's do PyBullet first. You have a given link, a given physical object. What changes about that object over the simulation? Well, so the dimensions are immutable between the boxes, or not. Absolutely, right? So the length, width, and height of a link in PyBullet doesn't change. The length and width and height of a voxel does change. Yeah. So the geometry of the individual parts in these two different simulators, one is mutable and one is not. Yeah. In both PyBullet and the Vox simulator, the, the given the uh, 3D position at any given time can change. The orientation can change in both PyBullet and Vox. The one difference here is the geometry itself. These voxels can pull and push on one another. They can get bigger. They can smaller. They get smaller. They can shear. They can twist or push relative to one another, which will become important as we go on. So far, so good. Questions? Okay. All right. So obviously what you're looking at in the GIF and the little cartoon in the upper left is coming from VoxCAD. It's a drawing of the underlying physics. So let's pull off the skin covering these voxels and look at what's actually going on in terms of the physics. Yeah? When you define a material in the vox simulator, you indicate place a whole bunch of voxels here, 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 and so on. Those voxels are not simulated in the physics as voxels. They're simulated as point masses. They're things that actually don't have a dimension at all. Okay? But those point masses, they do have, they have masses associated with them. I'm going to drop the subscripts here. These aren't important for us. These individual points have masses associated with them. And they also have associated with them forces. What are some of the forces that are acting on these point masses? Gravity, Gravity as usual, right? What else? If it was only gravity, all these voxels would be falling to the ground and staying there. What about shear? Shear. So there, some of these voxels have been welded to the world, so they're being held there by a, by a joint or by voxes equivalent of a joint. It's a fixed joint. It's holding the voxel there. The voxel is being pulled down by gravity. There would be shear if this thing had an actual extent in space, but it's a point, so a point cannot shear. You cannot pull on one side of a point and push upwards on the other. Yeah? Okay, gravity. You can have these points actually push and pull on one another, which is what you can see in the simulation, but how do they pull and push on one another? They are connected together by beams, which you can see in the picture here, these blue beams. These are known as Bernoulli beams for those that are interested. We're not going to go too deep into the physics of how this is all done, but for those that are interested in the mechanics of things, you can go have a look at uh, uh, Bernoulli beams. As you can see uh, in the picture, these beams themselves connect together, and depending on the forces that are acting on their ends, and what's at their ends, there are these point masses that are being pushed and pulled that can cause the beam to, actually here's an example of a beam being sheared. Its, it's tip is being pulled, uh, it's, its tip is being pulled to the left and its base is being pulled to the right, causes it to shear. You can also get twist, uh, elongation, compression. You can get all these forces. Uh, you can get all these forces. The forces don't act on the beams, Forces are only acting on the ends of the beams. You'll notice that there are two parameters associated with each beam. Both of them have a K, or, or uh, notated here as a K. Any guesses about what those parameters might be? I think there are two kinds of stiffness. There are two kinds of stiffness, absolutely. So there's linear stiffness which we've actually seen before in this course. Where and when did we talk about linear stiffness? When we talked about it, we just mentioned stiffness. The springs and the damping. The springs and the damping, right? So a normal spring, 
A slinky is also an example of a spring. It's got a particular uh, damping, so how quickly oscillations are damped out, but a stiffness. A slinky has a very low stiffness. It takes relatively little force to extend it and compress it. Yeah? When you compress a slinky all the way, and then you try and compress it even further, the stiffness goes way, way up, right? You can't do it yourself. You need to put it in a hydraulic press to keep going, yeah? So uh, not just springs, but all physical materials have stiffnesses associated with them. They have different kinds of stiffness associated with them, like linear stiffness, how much they resist being pushed and pulled, and k sub phi, uh, phi here is rotational stiffness, how much they resist being twisted about their long axis. Yeah? Okay. So, watching the GIF in the bottom left again, the blue voxels are blue point masses that are connected together with beams that have high stiffness. They're resisting the pushing and pulling of these point masses at their ends. The blue voxels or neighboring, uh, uh, sorry, uh, neighboring red voxels, the beams that connect those neighboring red voxels together, they have relatively low stiffness, low values for K. Everybody see that? Okay, all right. Okay, so that's voxelized. Let's jump back to VoxCAD here. Uh, this is a video taken from one of my, uh, one of my former students who is making a video tutorial of how to use the front end, which as you can see, looks like CAD software, thus the name VoxCAD. What you're gonna see uh, Sita do here is manually create the body of a robot. He's drawing, as you can see, red voxels. He switched to blue. Let me just pause for a moment if I can. You'll notice a couple things here. It's a little, you're probably not gonna be able to read it over here. There's a little color palette over here, black, red, blue, and yellow. And next to black, it says erase. Next to red, it says flexible. Next to blue, it says stiff. And next to yellow, it says uh, light. It's a light sensitive voxel. We'll talk about that later. So the colors represent different voxels with different material properties that you can, if you want, in VoxCAD, Build, uh, combine into a structure. You'll notice, obviously, where Sita is drawing here, he's drawing in uh, 2D. In the upper left here, you'll notice he's actually creating a 3D structure. So once he finishes with each 2D layer, he clicks on a button to move up and then starts drawing the third layer, and there's his final structure. You'll notice him now demonstrating that you can go in and actually fine tune some of these parameters. So stiffness are, is not the only parameter describing the material properties of these voxels. He's enabling, uh, setting some of the collision parameters. And you'll notice we no longer have, uh, we no longer have a passive material, we have an active material. It's a little difficult to see in this video, but all of the, actually all of the red and all of the blue voxels are now active. So there is an equivalent of a motor in the system. There is something that is internally applying forces. What are those forces ca causing the voxels to do? Jiggle, yes. Jiggle how? What's, what's happening to these voxels? They're expanding and contracting in volume. They're expanding and contracting in volume in phase with one another, meaning they all get bigger together and they all get smaller together. Uh, this will be an important detail in a little bit. Um, you can see, you'll see, like Pi Bullet, you can reach in and interactively apply forces of your own to the body. When you click on one of the voxels and pull, you're applying a linear force to the nearest point mass, which pulls on that point mass, which pulls on all of the beams that are attached to it, and the soft robot comes along with you. 
So at this point in the tutorial, this is around assignment, is it four or five, where you started to add motors to the system, right, to your robot, right? In your case, you have a motor that's applying torque, rotational force, that is causing one link to rotate relative to another one. In this case, there's some simulated motor. Again, the motor doesn't have an actual mass or a geometry uh, in this system. And that motor is applying an, a force inside the voxels, which causes them to expand and decrease in volume. Yeah which is a metaphor, it's not quite right, because remember, we're, the physics doesn't actually have any voxels associated with it. So how do you think the motors act on the physics to change the relative positions of the point masses so that when you draw those point, max, point masses as voxels, the voxels get bigger and smaller? Uh, you can't apply forces to the beams. Remember, the Fs are associated with the point masses. So we've got to apply some additional forces to the point masses to cause the voxels to get bigger and smaller. Seems kind of odd. How do we do that? We'll do this in 2D. I'm going to take each of the one, two, three, four, five point masses that I've drawn here, and instead of voxels, I'm going to draw five pixels. We can do this in 2D just as well as we could do it in 3D. We need to apply forces to these five point masses to cause uh, these squares to get bigger. It's hard to think about how to apply forces to make the four outer squares bigger, but how do we apply forces to the five point masses so that the middle square gets bigger? Yeah, exactly. So what forces are we applying here and how? It could be shear force, possibly. It could be torque, could be rotational force, could be linear force. We need to apply some of those kinds of forces to these five point masses so that at least the middle square gets bigger. If you came up to the board and grabbed these five points and started to push and pull, how would you pull, push and pull on them so the middle square would get bigger? Outward, Outward yeah. So all of these are going to have forces pushing away from the middle one, and these are, this one's going to have a force pushing it up. This one's going to have a force pushing it down, which when we then render it with Voxcraft, uh, Voxcad would produce a bigger pixel. Yeah, that's what's going on in here. The motor, the motors in Vox in Voxelize are not applying shear forces or torques. They're applying linear forces to the point masses. And the direction of those linear forces is away from the neighbors. So if we go to this particular point mass here, it has one neighbor to it, the north. So we're going to apply a force pushing away. Sounds kind of familiar. Huh? We're looking at individuals, and we're looking at neighbors. And then we're computing the behavior of, the, of that individual based on where the neighbors are and what they're doing. Where have we heard that before, recently, in this course? The close, the singing females, close. Anybody remember? Was it the lions? The lions and the gazelles. And just before we talked about the lions and gazelles, we talked about the boids, right? The virtual flocking uh, animals. The idea for this came from boids, yeah? Okay, if we wanted the square in the middle to get smaller, do the opposite, right? The motor, we would visit each point mass and we would apply a force towards, we would apply a force to that point mass towards uh, its neighbors, yeah? Okay, and that ends up simulating something in which these things are getting bigger and smaller, yeah? There's lots of different ways we could imagine simulating motors and causing changes to this internal structure. Why do you think the inventors of the Vox simulator back in 2015 chose to make the voxels bigger and smaller? 
They could have applied torques to sort of cause the voxels to rotate relative to one another, like in pi bullet. They chose a volumetric change. I'll give you a hint. They had, this didn't exist then, but they had this in mind. I'll pass this around. This is a hollow silicone voxel. This is the six walls of the voxel are made from uh, silicone, and it's hollow. So we've been working, we, uh, the community of works in soft robotics has been working towards sim to real for the last eight years since the publication of this paper with this physical realization in mind. We knew we could, and now we can, make these uh, hollow silicone voxels. Why simulate actuation or motors in this way? We can inflate and deflate them. Can inflate and deflate them. I'll show you sim to real in a moment. The idea was, the, the idea we had back then is, assuming we could make these and attach them together, we can create motors or pumps that would supply air or water or fluid into a hollow voxel to expand it, or pull air and fluid out of the voxel to decrease its volume. Yeah? So when this physics engine was constructed, uh, the motors control local volumetric changes. And that's what changes it from a passive material into an active robot. Okay, so now we're moving from mechanical engineering, material science, back into robotics, and we just can't seem to shake the quadruped body plan. Yeah, We're going to look at uh, uh, some of the first experiments that were done in this area using voxels to create, as usual, a radially symmetric four-legged robot. Should be very familiar at this point. Yeah. Okay, here is a, a paper we published four years ago uh, now. Uh, this was the first, this was not quite sim to real, but this was basically just trying to build a physical analog of the simulator. We had no hopes of actually transferring anything from simulation to real at this point. This was just kind of a prototype. You'll notice you can see these uh, hoses to the right here. These are just uh, air hoses, and these hoses are attached to simple uh, pumps that are with compressed air. And the graduate students that worked on this, they had like a, it was almost like a little keyboard or something you'd wear on your fingers and play like a piano where they could, by moving their fingers, send air into or pull air out of one or a few voxels. Yeah? When we saw video one or image one and image two, we felt pretty excited. When we saw video three, we got terrified. Why? Terrified in the sense of sim to real is going to be really hard in this domain. Well, doesn't it just straight up get smaller? It just kind of like you squeeze in these sides and these sides go up. Absolutely. So the volume, the volumes of the voxels, actually it's the pink voxels in this case that are being actuated. You might be able to see there's a yellow voxel in the background there. It is not innervated with an air hose, so it does not change volume. The, the three pink voxels, when we pull air out, the overall volume of the pink voxel or one of the pink voxel goes down, which is good, but it also uh, shears, it also shears, it twists relative to one another. There's all these complex changes in its geometry, which obviously we don't see, uh, we don't see in the simulation. So additional challenges here for sim to real is the actual geometries of the finite elements, which in our case are the voxels, are going to be very complicated. Question. So why did you need to have like a resting, expanding, and compressing state? Like, well, like why would why is there a need for like three when you could just have like one that's like the resting state is like really small and one of the expanding states really big. Excellent question. Yeah. So 
why do we even need the compression? If compression is complicated or is guaranteed to not reflect simulation, why not just not use it? Those are the right kinds of questions to ask. Hopefully by this point in the course, anything that looks difficult from a design or optimization perspective, let evolution take care of it, right? We could create an evolutionary algorithm around the Vox simulator and tell it you can expand, you can increase the volume of voxels away from their default volume, but you cannot decrease their volume below their de default volume, right? We could add a constraint on the evolutionary algorithm. We tell it there's things that it cannot do to keep evolution out of those parts of the fitness landscape that contain solutions that are unlikely to transfer to reality. Yeah? Okay, good question. Okay, back in 2019 with the voxels uh, you were just having a look at, this was sort of the best we could do at that time. Not quite going to be able to cross the sim to real gap yet. As you can see, we're not allowing the voxels to compress. This is not an evolved solution. This is just us sort of playing around with the system. But again, sim to real probably isn't going to happen uh, in this case. Why not? Imagine we have this simulated four-legged creature in voxel eyes, and we optimize locomotion for this. It's not going to transfer to reality. Why not? The motive expansion is different. Uh, actually, the motive expansion is, is fine. We can simulate this in, in VoxCAD, so if, uh, in VoxCraft, uh, in voxel eyes. So if the evolutionary algorithm came up with this strategy, it would transfer perfectly well to sim to real. But the evolutionary algorithm is not likely to come up with a strategy because it doesn't move, right? This is a low fitness solution. We couldn't, at that time, find a way to increase some subset of the voxels above their resting volume that would cause this thing to lift one or more of its legs off the ground. It just wasn't sort of strong enough. Yeah? Or there, wasn't, there just wasn't a solution in this space. Yeah? Okay, so we're still working on sim to real for, uh, for, for voxel-based robots. Okay. In the meantime, we're working on uh, sim and real. So we'll talk about sim in a moment, how we evolved, how we evolved soft robots in the simulator. But let's, uh, for fun, start with real first. Here's uh, Sam Kriegman, one of my former PhD students. And he's going to demonstrate in this video how to actually how these voxels were actually made. I'll speed this up. What you're going to see him pour out into this cup is what's called dragon skin. It's a commercial product, um, which is liquefied silicone. When you uh, when you heat it, it's as you can see, it's in liquid form, and as it starts to cool down, it solidifies. Into, uh, into the material you were, just, uh, you were just playing with. We made this little waffle type uh, device so that you could pour in the liquid dragon skin and it would cover five of the six sides of the voxels that are gonna make up the robot. And we made this little rotational arm here that <laughs> doesn't do anything more fancy than try and coat the inside walls of this waffle maker to uniform thickness. Once the dragon skin has cooled down and solidified, solidifies, you can cut it out uh, of the mold with an X-Acto knife. We've got five of the six sides of the voxels now. Sam just glued the four voxels together. What's the hole punch for? He's airway. punching neighboring holes. It's an airway. It's an airway. So one of the interesting things which we haven't been able to 
exploit yet or get an evolutionary algorithm to exploit is you can imagine punching a bunch of holes through neighboring voxels in a complex branching pattern, not unlike your own lungs, so that when you supply air into the robot, some arbitrary subset of the voxels increase in volume, and those that do not have a hole, those voxels that do not have a hole in them, they would stay at their default uh, size, yeah, or their default volume. So we could create a robot of arbitrary geometry, and we could distribute throughout that geometry uh, arbitrarily a distribution of muscles or active voxels that are going to increase and decrease in volume. Make sense? Okay. So we've got five of the six sides of our voxels. We need to add the sixth side. So we take some more liquefied dragon skin. Make sure we try and get a uniform thickness. Allow the dragon skin, uh, allow the dragon skin to cure and solidify. You can see Sam now adding in, uh, adding in the very small uh, air tubes here, so we can supply uh, we can supply pressurized air. Adding some additional liquefied uh, dragon skin to seal any small holes, and then finally, with a 99 cent syringe, pump some air into these voxels, and I'll play this back at real speed so you can see this at work. You can see how the voxels deform in volume. Sorry. So pink, pink voxels have holes in their sides, yellow voxels do not. Okay. Okay, so what you just watched was a tutorial video for an updated version of this Vox simulator uh, that we created here in my lab called Vox Craft. As you can see, it's kind of a crafty type thing, arts and crafts. If you go to the Vox Craft website, you can order all of these materials from Amazon for I think less than 300 bucks and make your own soft robots. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've seen the simulator. We've seen how uh, the Vox simulator simulates soft materials. We've seen how we can introduce uh, internal forces that turn that material uh, into a robot. You can imagine where we're going next. Back in 2013, uh, Nick created an evolutionary algorithm that is going to optimize where the voxels are placed and how material properties are distributed across those voxels to, surprise, surprise, evolve a robot that maximizes its speed from left to right. Yeah. Uh, Nick published this paper back in 2013. Um, this was while the simulator was being developed. So again, like Sims, this approach uh, was meant to sort of test, test out uh, the robustness or the um, stability of the simulator. You're looking at two different robots with different fitness, one with low fitness, one with high fitness. How is the high fitness one doing better than the low fitness one? They're both doing the soft robot equivalent of pronking here. The one with high fitness does this thing where it has like a weight in front of it, kind of. And what's happening is that like it has like a like the opposite behind it, where it's like when it wants to move forwards, it like shrinks the weight 
in the back so that it kind of falls forward? Absolutely. So you're no, you notice that it's using its mass distribution in a quote unquote intelligent way to sort of throw its center of mass forward. Yeah. So unlike us legged animals, le legged organisms, where we're rotating uh, parts of our body and we're not necessarily throwing our body, uh, our center of mass forward, we do when we run at high speeds. But the way in which soft robots and soft animals move from point A to point B is very different from the way that rigid robots tend to do it. Yeah. Okay. All right, and a couple other observations to make about the results from Nick's evolutionary algorithm here. You, you'll notice, obviously, the evolutionary algorithm is free to change the overall 3D geometry of the robot. The evolutionary algorithm is free to choose where or not to place voxels. And you can see it's also distributing material properties across the body. There's a patch of red, there's a patch of green, and it's very difficult to see, but in the lower robot, you'll notice just behind it, there's a small patch of light blue voxels. And we'll talk about that in a moment. What evolutionary algorithm do you think Nick used to do this? You'll notice that it isn't just a random uh, scattering of red and green and blue. There are gradients or patches of these different material properties across the 3D body. Where have we seen an evolutionary algorithm that does that before? Hypernate. Hypernate, absolutely. So Nick took hypernate and connected it to voxelize and to achieve the very first evolution, uh, uh, evolutionary design of soft robots. Yeah. So very similar to what we saw when we talk, talked about uh, hypernet. In this case, we're going to ask our CPPNs, our compositional pattern producing networks, to paint a regu regular patterns across three-dimensional space. So we start by defining some three-dimensional space, some empty, uh, some empty cube. And then inside that empty cube, we're going to distribute a lattice and visit a bunch of points. We're going to visit each point in that lattice in turn. You'll notice the input to uh, the input to the CPPN is x, y, z. So the x, y, and z coordinate of each point. There's a fourth input called D. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Remember, in CPPNs, we input coordinates to things in space spaces of arbitrary dimension. And in this case, and we can interpret the outputs from the CPPN in lots of different ways. When we talked about hypernet and CPPNs, we could think of the single output as painting a certain amount of black in, onto a picture. It could be painting a note onto a musical scale. It could be painting RGB values into a colorized image or video and so on. In this case, Nick gave each CPPN two output neurons. The first output neuron is squashed with an activation function to zero or one. So the first output neuron is a binary neuron. If at a given XYZ position, the output is zero, when we propagate those XYZ positions through the network, if the output is zero, don't put a voxel at that position. If the output neuron for that X set of XYZ coordinates is one, place a voxel at that position. Yeah? So presence or absence of a voxel. The second number, we're going to assume that that's the CPPN painting a material property onto that voxel, which is going to be represented in VoxCAD as a color. Yeah? OK. In this very first attempt to do this, Nick uh, uh, clamped the second output neuron, or used an activation function that would spit out one of four integers, one, two, three, or four. So he's restricting the CPPN to paint one of four possible material properties onto a given voxel. OK, what are those four material properties? They're, they're going to be represented by red 
green, light blue, and dark blue. You can't see any dark blue in this particular example. I'm going to hold off telling you what these four material properties are. I'm going to show you some videos in a moment, and I want you to try and guess what those four material properties are. So far, so good? Any questions? OK. All right, off we go. I'm going to skip over the beginning here if I can, because he's going to tell us what the four material properties are. So here we go. When this paper was published, the media's description of these were jello bots for obvious reasons. Okay. What you're going to watch now, we're going to watch a series of snapshots from one evolutionary run. Here's the best CPPN in generation zero, best CPPN's result in generation one, best. CPPN in the population at generation two, and so on. Ah, okay, so there's, there's your, your readout. Okay, let's talk about the red and green voxels for a moment, as it shows here in the video. Red is contract, then expand, and green is expand, then contract. If I play back some of these, if you watch really carefully, you'll notice when the green voxels are getting bigger, the red ones are getting smaller. And when the red ones are getting bigger, the green ones are getting smaller. Where have we seen that idea before? This is going a fair bit back in the course now. We've got groups of active voxels, red and green, and you can think of the groups of green voxels as all, as all having connecting holes. They're all connected to one another with airflow, and someone or something is supplying air into all the green voxels, causing them to increase in volume, at the same time that someone or something is pulling air out of all of the connected red voxels. The green muscle group is getting bigger while the red muscle group is pulling in and vice versa. Where have we seen that idea before? I'm now starting to talk about red and green voxels as muscles. Your muscle groups work in exactly the same way. Good, good guess. So it's, it's not about the flight phase and stance phase, because we don't really, I mean, there might may be a flight, stay, flight phase or a, and a stance phase here. It doesn't necessarily correlate with the two muscle groups. Your biceps and triceps work the same way, right? When your bicep gets smaller, when you, con when you compress it, you relax your triceps, and the muscle groups, the muscles in your triceps actually get bigger in volume. So one thing is getting smaller while the other thing gets bigger. When you contract your triceps and relax your biceps, this happens. Where did we see this before? We saw a robot that had something very similar. Or what is this called? Anybody remember? <laughs> so this is the agonist Agonist and antagonist, antagonist uh, muscle pairs. Yeah. So pretty much all of the muscle groups in your body, they're all paired together. Yeah. So that when one pulls, the other relaxes, and when the other pulls, the other one relaxes and gets bigger, which causes overall body motion. We saw this in the anthropomorphic robot that had uh, a shoulder, upper arm, lower arm, hands and, hands and fingers, and was trying to do 
active categorical perception. It was trying to tell the difference between ellipsoids and spheres. You know? OK. An arbitrary connection, but just trying to bring back some of the things we've talked about already. OK. You'll notice uh, it also mentions light blue voxels are soft tissue. And dark blue voxels are hard tissue. So the blue, the two blue type, the two types of blue voxels, these are passive voxels. They have no holes in their sides. So they cannot actively increase or decrease their own volume, but their volumes can change if they are pulled and pushed by their neighbors. Their neighbors may be active or passive voxels also that are being pulled somewhere by red or green voxels. Where in your body do you have passive soft tissue? We just talked about muscles. What's the closest physiological analog of these light blue voxels? Uh, cartilage, yeah, cartilage is somewhere in between. Yeah, not, not that, it's not that soft, but it is passive. Yeah, absolutely. Where do we have soft, passive material? Exactly, yeah. So that's, that the, you can think of the light blue voxels here as the physiological analog of fat. You, you can't see any here. You'll see small flashes of dark blue voxels, which are passive and this should actually say stiff, going back to our Ks, stiff voxels. They, they aren't active, but they resist being pulled and pushed by their neighbors. What's the physiological analog of that in you? Bones, exactly, yeah? So red and green here is muscle, uh, light blue is fat, and dark, uh, dark blue is bone. You're seeing the evolution of locomotion, but as always, we're also seeing uh, perverse instantiation here. Evolution is evolving robo soft robots for us that do exactly what we ask them to do, move as quickly as possible from left to right. But at least for us, when we first saw this, not quite in the way we expected. How so? Where are the blue voxels? Why are there no blue voxels? They're kind of just dead weight. They're dead weight. Why? Because the uh, the whole advantage of like the um, the best way for it to move is to kind of like bounce itself as much as possible. And if you can't have parts that don't bounce, then they're just going to hold you back. Okay, remember our discussion of locomotion that we're always trying to balance four different desiderata? In most of these robots, you notice some of them have some passive and soft material, but most of them are basically just balls of muscle. So the evolutionary algorithm, most of the time, not all the time, is hitting a very extreme trade-off between those four desiderata. What is that extreme trade-off? It's maximizing one of the four desiderata of locomotion, which is displacement, move as fast as possible. But there's always a cost. What's the cost here? Is it efficiency? Efficiency or, or energy, right? We are not just balls of muscle for very good reason, right? It's energetically costly. But in this case, where evolution can actually add and remove the total amount of forces, the total amount of volumetric change, given the chance to do so, evolution tends to just make a huge ball of, of muscle. Right? If you're evolving bodies in a pie bullet, you're probably fixing the number of motors, so evolution can't get at that particular solution. Yeah? Let's go back to the, the sort of fun examples here. There is a little bit of use of passive material. The next one you're going to see quite a bit. How is it useful here? Or, or the next one also. So passive soft material 
is sometimes useful. How so? This is a little trickier. Ideas? Okay, yeah, it's possible that it's some sort of glue or stabilizing uh, presence. You'll notice in the next robot, there's sort of like two legs, and they're connected by this bridge of soft material, which seems to actually be causing the two legs to move in phase with one another, yeah? So it looks like in, in a lot of these videos, the, the fat or the passive soft material is kind of absorbing a lot of linear forces and canceling them out or aligning their movements so they do things together. Yeah. It's kind of like the soft robot equivalent of passive dynamic walking. Remember when we first talked about legged locomotion, we actually saw some quote unquote robots that had no motors whatsoever and their physical structure uh, exploited the transformation of kinetic energy or potential energy into kinetic energy. We're still working on it, but it looks like there's some sort of version of that going on here as well, even though there's no penalty for use it, basically being a ball of muscle. There's no energetic penalty here. Okay. Okay, so again, this was the very first attempt to, uh, to evolve robots using soft material. Uh, in a follow-up paper a couple years later, uh, myself and our colleagues at Yale published this particular paper where, as usual, we do what we like to do best, which is torture robots. So as you're going to see in the next couple of videos, these are results from 10 different evolutionary algorithms that we ran the first one we ran on an undamaged four-legged robot, and then we also evolved locomotion for these increasingly injured robots. Like when I showed you this before with the evil starfish, the rigid robot, each of these 10 experiments has a phase one and a phase two. In phase one, we're going to evolve, we're going to evolve how we supply air in and out of a fixed body, so we're not going to evolve bodies and brains for a moment. We're going to evolve how we push and pull air in and out of the uninjured quadruped robot and see how far we can evolve it to move. Then in experiments two through 10, we're going to cut off part of the body. Like the evil starfish, the robot can't sense that something has gone wrong, but it's got to recover in some way. As you may recall, when we looked at the evil starfish recovering, basically speaking, a rigid robot, when injured, has only one type of response available, which is to change how it moves. Yeah? It's now a three and a half legged robot rather than a four legged robot. So, how it rotates or how it sends forces to the motors is kind of the only thing it can do. In the case of soft robots, they have two options available to them. After injury or after suddenly there's a drop in fitness, there's two different ways that evolution can respond to that injury. One of them, like rigid robots, is it some simply alters the way that it moves. But soft robots have a second option that isn't available to rigid robots. What is it? But I thought that how they move is based on like the material properties and just like a result of that. Uh, yeah, how they move is a result of the, the material properties. That, that's true. But the material properties and the air that's pulled, pushed into or pulled out of the robot in, in, the, in terms of soft robots is going to change not just how they move, but also change, potentially change what? We put a little bit of air in, maybe it changes how they move, like in the video you just saw. But if we put a lot of air in, 
what's going to happen? Change with their structure and like mass distribution. It's going to change their overall structure. Yeah. So, basically speaking, what we wanted to see in this paper was the ways in which soft robots can respond to changes in their environment or changes to themselves. Right? Heraclitus said, man never enters the same river twice. We're going to deploy robots out into the real world. They're going to experience changes. They're going to experience unexpected things out there in the world. Rigid robots, they can change how they behave, but soft robots can also change their structure. If you were a four-legged robot and suddenly you're a three-and-a-half-legged robot, you could learn or evolve how to mo start moving again with three-and-a-half legs, or you could, something we humans can't do, You already know how to walk with four legs. Now you've got three and a half legs. Extend the half leg to be a full leg. Extend the half leg. Regenerate or regrow the leg. Evolve a strategy that puts lots of air into the site of damage to, in essence, make those voxels really big and approximate or, quote unquote, regrow back the fourth leg. That is something that is at least a possibility for soft robots. That is not a possibility for rigid robots. Make sense? OK, let's see what it does. This is, uh, I'm sorry, I've got the red box around the wrong one. We're looking at, which one are we looking at here? We're looking at half body here. Yeah, experiment nine here. So we've become really sadistic here. We've cut the robot in half. What you're watching in the first part of this video is this is the original controller. This is what the air did when it was a full four-legged robot. Not surprisingly, it doesn't do much. I I'm sorry, I misspoke. This is actually at the end of phase two. It's actually evolution has adapted how air is pushed into and pulled out of the robot to move forward as quickly as possible, despite the fact that it's now been halved. This is the best it was able to do in this, in this situation. Yeah. In this case, we've, we did not allow evolution to put in a lot of air. So it's not allowed to change its structure. It's just sort of changing you know, this overall pattern of movement. OK. Let's have a look at some other examples. Here's the undamaged robot. Here's an evolved strategy for pushing and pulling air into and out of the robot, not bad. We're going to cut off all four legs now. Uh, right. And you can see in this case, evolution came up. In this particular run, evolution discovered what we were expecting. It actually grows back the legs, doesn't explicitly grow them back, but it figures out a way to request air such that that's more or less the result. Question. How do you deal with the mobility of these air pumps? Because at some point, this thing has to detach from its hose. Yep, good question. This is the dirty little secret of soft robotics. No one's figured out a good answer to that yet. Um, there's lots of partial solutions. They're n none of them are really satisfying. One of them is to just make these big enough that it can carry the pump along with us. There's no reason why these voxels couldn't be a meter on a side. Right? That would, that would deal with it. If we want soft robots, no one has a good answer to that yet. OK. Let's go back to our, uh, let's go back to the ninth experiment here. Where we're cutting the robot in half. In the video I'm going to show you now, the robot is, uh, evolution actually did hit on a strategy that changes the structure of this robot rather than just the way it moves to recover the ability to locomote forward. As you would expect, it's going to probably grow back the missing half of the body, right? It's obvious that that's what's going to happen next. OK, good. Some of you have, have learned at this point, thinking about thinking is misleading.
for what happened in this case. It just made the limbs really small, so it could work kind of like the one that like blew up in the other one. Absolutely. So it's it's decreasing the volume of the voxels, but not too much. Remember, we put a constraint on there that it shouldn't make voxels too small. It's making all the rest of the voxels bigger, which has the overall net effect of basically getting rid of the remaining two legs. And this isn't quite legged locomotion anymore. It's actually the most ancient form of land locomotion which I mentioned briefly when we first started talking about locomotion. I walked you through the table of contents of Alexander's book, The Principles of Animal Locomotion. In Alexander's book, each chapter goes through all the different ways that Mother Nature has discovered to allow animals to get from point A to point B. What's the most ancient of land, strategies of land locomotion? Does anybody remember? Uh, crawling, yeah, it's kind of obviously a form of crawling. It's a form of collective motion that is very old, and surprise, surprise, very old things Mother Nature, Mother Nature tends to keep around and repurpose for other things. You use it in your esophagus. When you swallow something, a band of muscle at the top of your throat constricts pushes the food a little bit down, next one, next one, next one, next one. Anybody remember what this is called? This is peristalsis. We saw it also when we looked at the 10 different robots that were all evolved to move and the two snake robots evolved this sort of traveling wave. There's a little bit of a traveling wave here. It's not so obvious to see. It's, all, it's some, sort of somewhere between crawling and peristalsis. Okay. All right. Last experiment I want to show you with uh, soft robots here. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of my graduate students took Vox, the Voxelize and Voxcad uh, code base which was developed back in 2013, 2014 for CPUs and rewrote it for GPUs. Uh, you can now play around with the new version. It's basically, this is Voxcraft here. So on the Voxcraft website, you can download and play around with the GPU version of the voxel-based uh, physics engine. We switched from CPUs to GPUs, which, as always, allows us to do things at scale. All of the soft robots you've seen so far were made up of a dozen or 20 or 30 voxels. Now we can do, I think the record is, uh, what are we at now? I think about 20,000, maybe 30,000. Finite element methods is a very old approach in engineering. The more finite elements you can play with, the more complex structure and functions you can create. Yeah? Okay, so when we finally got this working on a GPU, we asked ourselves, what's a good demo? What could we show that you can do with lots and lots of voxels? One of the things you can do is make lots and lots of voxel-based robots and put those voxel, those vox bots together to make bigger voxel-based robots. My grad students deliberately did not show me any of the development of this and then just showed me this video. I would have thought it was impossible, but there you go. The minute that video ends, I asked a question. You're probably all wanting to ask the same question, which is, does it do anything, it do anything? <laughs> exactly? At this point, they couldn't get it to actually move. They could get it to assemble in the physics engine and not crash. OK, good start, good start. Since then, 
They have been able to create some fractal bots, fractal robots. These are the first fractal robots that do move. Probably not anything we're going to be able to transfer to reality yet. What are you looking at? You're looking at, obviously, uh, a voxel-based robot uh, over here. And these have been put together into a larger, uh, into a larger version in the same pattern. So it's bots made of bots. You'll notice, obviously, this one is not phys very physically realistic. The other thing you can observe, um, you'll notice we're drawing the trajectory of motion of both robots. One displaces, one doesn't. So this was just my grad students playing around with fractal bots. But after watching this, this led us to a research question, which is, are there simple robots that when put together self-similarly, put together in the same pattern, produce the same pattern at the larger scale than they did at the smaller scale. Make sense? Could be useful for robotics if you have a small robot that does something useful, and then you have another environment where you want, you basically want the same functionality, but at 10 times the scale, instead of creating a whole new robot for that environment, stack them together in the same way so that they, you realize robots that are structurally self-similar. Structurally self-similar, meaning the structure is the same at different size scales, structurally self-similar. But you want them to also be functionally self-similar. You want them to move or behave in the same way at the small scale as they, do, as they do at the large scale. So this particular robot that you're looking at here is structurally self-similar. We put it together in the same way, but not functionally self-similar. Make sense? We tried to figure out how to do this by hand. Not surprisingly, we failed. Guess what we did? brought in an evolutionary algorithm to find things that are structurally, find robots that are structurally and functionally self-similar. What do you think the fitness function was in that evolutionary algorithm? We evolved populations of CPPNs that would paint a pattern that we then simulated, we simulated in Voxcraft, which gives us some sort of behavior. Then what did we do? And then how did we compute the fitness of this thing, do you think? Well, if you're combining them like from like a one by one to like a two by two, then you'd probably have a fitness function be like, is the one by one behavior like half of what the two by two behavior is? Uh, it could be. Um, so a couple details. We started with three by three by three. So the CPPN is painting inside a three by three by three empty cage. And then we're going to take whatever set of voxels are placed inside that three by three cage and make three by three by three copies of them and put them together to make the bigger one. So we got small and big. We can simulate both in Voxcraft. What's the fitness function? difference in there and we're going to minimize the difference and we're going to normalize the rate of movement by the size of the robot right so we're trying to evolve something that when combined self-similarly structurally self-similarly will be functionally self-similar everybody see that again we wouldn't be here talking about it if it wasn't possible here's another failure Here's uh, one result from evolution that got halfway there. The base unit doesn't work, it doesn't move, but the big one does. So this is the inverse of what we just saw. Yeah. Finally, we got this. In this case, blue and red are the agonist and antagonistic groups. It's not perfectly functionally self-similar. You'll notice the little magenta 
the little magenta trajectories, not quite the same, but similar, getting there. Why does this particular fractal arrangement lead to functional self-similarity? If any of you have ideas, we'd love to hear. I, I don't know. I, as always, evolution is smarter than we are. OK, I think, oh, sorry. OK, we've got one minute left. One minute left. Again, just because we wanted to flex our GPU muscles, we found one that was pretty much functionally self-similar, not just at two levels, but at three. I think the, the fractal robot on the right, I think that's the record for total number of voxels to date. OK, we will leave things there for today. You have a quiz due tonight. Good luck with all your other final projects and preparing for final exams. We'll see you on Tuesday.